And there he goes. Okay. All right. Welcome everybody once again. We have greeted each other, and I'm gonna ask brother his name again. And I'm glad for everybody that's here today. Also explained that due to the fact that the youth from the youth hostel were naughty, that they were or are currently still being punished until they learn to behave themselves, if I understood correctly, and then perhaps they can come back here again. So what we're going to do now is we're going to see how we can organize it that we can still have a Bible study with them. Most likely it will be that we will have to go over there to the youth hostel, but I'm going to discuss this with Heidi and then I'll get back to you and let you guys know if there's the possibility to do something like that. Because for now, it's just us, a small group for now again. Right. But we know that God says in his word that we're two or three are gathered in his name, there he is in the midst of them. So we thank God for that. Right. Okay. So before we start the Bible study, Joshua, you know how we usually do it. There's a time and an opportunity for people to give testimony. There's a verse, or there are verses in Scripture which mention that everybody has something to give in the body of Christ. It's not just the person who teaches, but everybody can give something. So if there's someone who has a psalm, or a word, word of wisdom, prophetic word, or anything that the Lord lays on your heart, a testimony that you'd like to share, of the goodness of God, how God helped you this week, for example, then you can gladly do so. This is the time now for doing so. Would you like to do something like that, Joshua? Is there something you want to say? Don't feel pressurized. If you want to, you can. You don't have to. If you don't have to. Yeah, no. Thanks. Yeah. You can come up here, Joshua. You can stand here. You want to, you want to get your Bible? Okay. Okay, I'm going to read out the Bible. Um, this is why Jesus says to the people, uh, in, uh, Johannes writes it, that this is the sixth uh, lap, the, the sixth chapter. chapter. Yeah. In the verse 27, Jesus says to them, is it in Africa? Yeah, can it be in Africa? No, 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 Maar om die prijs wat blijkt tot in die eeuwige leven, want die, want die, wat die sien vir die mense, jylle sal geef, want hom het God die Vader geseel. Okay. Alright, thank you very much Joshua for sharing that with us. What does that mean to you, that verse? It means, uh, you see, we work, it works and we get paid. But the price we get paid still gets up. This is talking about that price. Work for the price that never gives up. The price is for the everlasting life. Mm. You must work for the everlasting life that never gets up. Mm -hmm. And is that here on earth or is that in heaven? Yeah, the everlasting uh, uh, price is in heaven. Okay. So we're supposed to have treasures in heaven. Yeah. And how do you get treasures in heaven? What must you do to have treasures in heaven? Uh, you must uh, follow God. Okay, yeah, that's true. And what else can you do? What do you think? This past week, we had Pinkster. What did the people do? What had Helle gedoen? There we go. You must witness. Why? So that people come to faith. And then when people come to faith, this is fruit. We sow the seed, remember? And then we also water. Maybe it's not us who water. Sometimes we're just sowing the seed and somebody else waters. But God brings the growth. So this is what lasts. Souls that come to faith. People that give their lives to Jesus Christ. Thank you very much, Joshua. Is there something you would like to say? 
Maybe. I'm just going to check if I can put the light on here. Thank you, brother Joshua. Thank you. It was nice. What a surprise. Yeah. We must gather spiritual wealth. Yeah. And not wealth that the flesh desires. But I just want to speak today about the verse in Acts about brother Paul, someone that was not found in Christianity. He wasn't based by the beliefs of God, but he was a he was also a God. He was also busy persecuting men that believed in yeah. Christ yeah. until Jesus touched him in a very ferocious way. But at the end, there is a a little piece that was done and we know Paul wrote most of the letters in the Bible and um, this man was on a ship and got shipwrecked they were on a little island and people welcomed him in but as they approached the, the land he was bit by a viper a slum a snake, snake yeah. yeah and then the funny part is the people thought he was going to die but because of his beliefs in Jesus Christ of Nazareth he didn't die and um, people thought he was a god I mean the, the, the most of the story there for me is just I don't think there's a there's an endless possibility to what God can do for people mm. yeah. and if we, if we believe just like just like Peter who approached the, the, the ocean water two steps, three steps, he gathered, but as he began to doubt, he started sinking in the ocean. Mm. And um, so that just gives us a point that we, we shouldn't we shouldn't blame the Lord or blame the surroundings when we fail, but ourselves and our hearts and our doubts, our spiritual beliefs. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That's the message that I'd like to share today. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So now, let's just have some time in which we can pray before we start with the Bible study. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to be gathered here today. We thank you for the three of us who are here today, and we pray that you speak to us. Because if you don't speak to us, Lord, then, Lord, we cannot learn without your guidance through the Holy Spirit. Forgive me where I am so worldly and where I do many things which are useless, Lord. We have not prepared adequately, Lord. We have not spent enough time in your word, reading, meditating on your word, studying, Lord, when it came to the preparation for today. But Lord, thank you that you are gracious even when we fail, and we heard it today, we can and will fail, but you are gracious, you are long-suffering, and you help us back up again, like you did with Peter, when Peter began to sink. You stretched out your hand when he called out your name, and you pulled him up, and you told him that he had little faith. So many times, Lord, we do things we shouldn't be doing. We turn from you, we sin against you. But even when we are not loyal to you, you remain loyal. And we thank you for that, Lord. But we do not want to misuse your grace either. Help us to live our lives for you. We need the guidance of the Holy Spirit, so I ask that you guide us now, that you open our eyes, that we can see our ears, that we can hear, that you work in our hearts, that we can understand. It stands in the book of Acts that you work in the heart of Lydia, and that's why she was able to understand the Word of God. And we need you to work in our hearts. We need you to please wash and cleanse and purify our minds through the water bath of the Word of God, because our minds need to be renewed. We have the mind of Christ as children of God, but it still needs renewal, because we fill ourselves throughout the duration of the day with many things that we should not fill ourselves with. Or we see things involuntarily. We don't want to see it, but we might see it. For example, we might see a picture somewhere, a poster hanging there, and there's something sinful depicted on it, and that might cause us to sin. Lord, wherever we've opened ourselves up to sin, whether it was now deliberate or undeliberate, Lord, we ask you for forgiveness. We ask that you guide and lead us into all truth because
because you are the truth. Jesus, you are the truth. And your word is the truth. We ask that you lead us into all righteousness through the Holy Spirit. We ask that you also speak through me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, I mentioned before already that we had, not so long ago, but last week, we had what we call in Afrikaans Pinkster. In English, it's called Pentecost. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Pinkster, Pentecost, as you can see here. Yeah. The question that we will ask ourselves is what is Pentecost? What is Pinkster? Now, there's a verse in Afrikaans. Is there anyone who would like to read it? 1 Corinthians 14 26. Okay, sure. I will read it. Who would set them here? So that's what I mentioned before, that everybody has something to give. Do you see? Yes. It says, Gewohnen, which means usually everybody has something to give. Psalm, Anderlesen, Offenbaren, Ausgewohnen, Tabes, Klang, Eglech, Stefan. Alright? So, these are gifts, by the way, which not everyone has. Because people will teach you, especially in specific denominations and specific circles, they will say that if you don't have the gift of speaking in tongues, for example, then you don't have the Holy Spirit. That's what some people will teach you. But this is not what the Bible teaches. I do not have the verse now. I will get back to you and show you where it says. It says it like this. Does everyone speak in tongues? Does everyone do this and this and that? So thereby it implies, no, not everyone does that. Is everyone an apostle? No, not everyone is an apostle. Not everyone is a prophet. The Holy Spirit, it says in the Word of God, He decides whom He gives which gift. We can ask for it. He says, ask for the gifts. Uns kann Gott fra and Gott soll besleit, but he uns kriegt. He will decide which gifts he will give to us. Now, I don't have the gift of being able to interpret tongues, for example. God has given me the gift of speaking in tongues, but I do not have the gift of interpreting speaking in tongues, for example. Now, what is the why do we have all these gifts? For the edification and the upbuilding of the body of Christ. That's the reason why there are all these gifts. The gifts are not there to show off. Many times people use gifts to show off. But the gift is there so that we can build each other up in our most holy faith. If I speak in a different tongue, for example, and people don't understand what I'm saying, it's completely useless because people don't know what I'm saying. How can they say Amen? It stands in 1 Corinthians. It speaks about this. How can someone say Amen to what I am saying if I speak in a different tongue and I don't understand what I'm saying and the brothers and sisters don't understand what I am saying? And then it says, if somebody comes in and that person doesn't know anything about God and His Word, they think, hey, thank you, is mal, because everybody speaks in different tongues. By the way, there's an order how to do it. The Bible also says how to do it. There are churches where everybody speaks at the same time, which the Bible does not say. This is not how it must be done. But God is a God of peace, it says, and there must be order. That means there are a few people, I'm not sure how many again, I think it's two or three, I'm speaking under correction. They speak, and then there's somebody, then they must be quiet, and somebody who has this gift to be able to interpret what they're saying, this brother or sister 
or these brothers or sisters will then interpret what has been said. Okay, it speaks here in 1 Corinthians 14 about the gifts. And it speaks in thir chapter 13 also about the gifts. The greatest gift in the end, which Paul here, you mentioned the Apostle Paul, mentions the greatest gift is love. Love. Pursue love. 1 Corinthians 14, 1. Yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. And then he even says that the one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues. Many times people think, I speak in tongues. Then that means I'm a very spiritual person. Not so. The one who prophesies is greater than you, unless you also have the gift of interpretation. It says here, if you have the gift of interpretation, one who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but one who prof prophesies, excuse me, edifies the church. So, everything we do is for the edification, for the upbuilding of the body of Christ. So, this is something many times in many churches, no matter where you go, you don't really see this being practiced, do you? You usually have the pastor up front and he preaches and you have a few people singing. In some churches, they permit some of this. They give room for this as well. But this is what God tells us. Normally, this is the case. All right. Now, to answer the question which we had before, and if you want to find out more about this, I encourage you, read in 1 Corinthians 13, 14, chapter 12. These chapters speak about the gifts that God gives and how these gifts must be used within the body of Christ. Now, what is Pentecost? Pfingstus die Tät, wann er die Hälfte fies, nahe die Disciples des Führers, um Hölle verhält, um die Wort von Gott, die Fuhe Jus, bekannt nach Folgen. Der Verleg, andere mit Fier, ihren Verschärften, und die Verse danach. So, the time that we remembered now this past week, Pentecost, reminds us of the Holy Spirit being poured out. Jesus said before he left, he said in Acts chapter 1, he speaks about and says that they have to wait, his disciples, and then the Holy Spirit will come. So they had to wait for the Holy Spirit to come, the gift of the Father which was to be sent. And he said it will happen shortly. So they waited approximately, and I'm speaking again on the correction, I think it's 40 days that they waited. And then the gift was sent. The gift was given, which one can read, as it says here in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, we cannot effectively teach the Word of God and tell others the good news. Without the Holy Spirit, without the power of the Holy Spirit, we cannot effectively tell other people about Jesus. You see, the difference between Jesus and the Pharisees was that the Pharisees, they knew this, well, not this, but the Old Testament, it's a pretty big part of the book, they knew the Old Testament very well. Many of them, even Peter, and all the other disciples, this part here, they already knew very well, the thick, thick part here. The Bible is comprises of 66 books. How many in the Old Testament? How many in the New Testament? 66 in total. And it's one book. Now in the Old Testament, there are 39. And in the New Testament, they have 27. So, they knew the Old Testament. They had to memorize this. They went to school at a young age and they had to memorize this. And then, if they wanted to go further, they went to another school where they were then taught by a rabbi. You see, you mentioned Paul. Paul was taught by Gamaliel. Gamaliel was a rabbi. He only had, I think, it was three or four students in his lifetime that he taught. And Paul was one of them. He was, as he said, he was the smartest of his whole generation. So he was a very smart person. And there again, speaking on the correction, always verify what I said. Now, 
The other disciples were not like this. Some of them were even illiterate. They couldn't write, they couldn't speak. Peter, for example, they say, whether this is true or not, only God knows, but they say he was not able to write. Now, the first and second letter of Peter, he had somebody write for him. He would dictate and somebody wrote for him. The same with Paul. Paul did not write all of his own letters. Sometimes you see it says a name of somebody else who wrote it, but it's a letter from Paul nonetheless because he dictated it and then somebody else wrote it down. Now, these people, whether they were now highly skilled and learned people or whether they were what people would refer to as the scum, they themselves referred to themselves, the, act, the apostles, excuse me, referred to themselves as the scum of the earth. Now, whatever, whatever they were, whether they were high in society or low in society, God used all of these people mightily for his kingdom's sake. And the same he wants to and can do with us today. No matter how skilled we are, no matter how learned we are, he can and wants to and will work through each and every one of us if we have the Holy Spirit. The next question is, who is the Holy Spirit? He is the head of the field. The Holy Spirit, first of all, is God. And the Holy Spirit is so much more than we as children of God can ever know, and we shall also look a little bit at who the Holy Spirit is. Ons het die kracht van die Heilige Geest nodig. Handelinge 1, 8, dit word ons ook al tevoor. Maar jullie sal kracht ontvang wanneer die Heilige Geest oor jullie kom, en jullie sal my getuies wees, like you said Joshua, we have to be getuie, getuies is the Christus, Getuies wees in Jerusalem, sowel as in die hele Judea en in Samaria, en tot in die uithoeke van die wereld. Ons benodig die kracht van God. What I wanted to also mention before is, the difference between Jesus and the Pharisees. They had all this head knowledge, but there was no power. When he spoke the word of God, the difference between Jesus and the difference between all the Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes and Essener, those are all Jewish sects, zealots, there were a lot of Jewish sects back then. They had always, this is what Stephen says in Acts chapter 7, they always resisted the Holy Spirit. They did not accept the Holy Spirit. They stoned in many different ways, killed many of the prophets, and then they did the same thing with Stephen. They also stoned him when he spoke the truth to them. They did not want to hear the truth. Jesus had the power of the Holy Spirit. First, remember, after he was baptized, first thing was he was baptized. After he was baptized, he went, the Holy Spirit, not the devil, the Holy Spirit led him into the desert to be tempted of the devil. That happens in our lives as well as Christians nowadays. The Holy Spirit will lead you deliberately into difficult situations because he wants to change you. He wants to change us into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you go through tests, remember I mentioned this on Tuesday, that you have to go through difficult times. What use is it if you study, 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 study? The Bible says, study to show yourself approved. An approved workman need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, if I study and I never have a test, why do I study? It's the same in life. You always study so that you can then Put that which you have learned, memorized, studied, into practice. I learn how to fix things, then I start fixing things. I don't just sit there for the rest of my life and I learn how to fix things and I know it all up in here, but I never put it into practice. Then it's useless. Same thing when it comes to the Word of God. What I have read and heard and understood, which the teacher, who's the Holy Spirit, has explained to me, this I put into practice. Because... He will tell you how to do it. If we lack wisdom, it says in the book of James, we can ask God and he will give us. But we must not ask in doubt because if we ask in doubt, we will not receive. We must believe. So this is another thing where God tests your faith. Do you believe what I say? Chloe, what I say. As you may chloe, then shall you do it. Now, we need the power of the Holy Spirit. Point number one. Okay, so we need the power of the Holy Spirit, but why? Now here, point number one, 
Die Heilige Geest zal ons die kennis van God uit die dood opwek, net soos hy Jesus uit die dood opgewek het. Vergelijk Romeine 8 en Omdat die Geest van hom, door wie Jesus uit die dood opgewek is, in jullie woon, zal hij door wie Christus uit die dood opgewek is, ook jullie sterfelijke, excuse, sterfelijke lichame levend maak, door sy geest wat in jullie woon. Romeine 8 11. The only way we will be raised from the dead is if we have the Holy Spirit living in us. He was the same Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead. If He lives in us, dan zal Hij ons uit die dood opwek. Maar as Hij nie in ons lewe, dan sal ons nie uit die dood opstaan nie. We need the Holy Spirit to raise us from the dead. The same way He did it with Jesus Christ. He will do it with us. Slechts die Heilige Gees kan ons aanmoedig om die woord van God sonder vrees en met vrijmoedigheid te verkondig. Vergelijk handelingen 4, 29, vers 31. So it stands here. I will give you some time to read it for yourself. Acts 4, 29 to 51, where it speaks about that we need the Holy Spirit to be able to be bold. Where they prayed here at the end, you see, they prayed. Hulle is allemaal met die Heilige Geest vervuld en het met vrijmoedigheid die woord van God verkondigd. These are the same people, think about it, think about it, the same people that just a few days before were so scared they were hiding from everybody. And all of a sudden they were ready to lay down their lives for Jesus Christ. This was not in their own strength. Dit is nie uit hulle eie kracht nie. Dit is die kracht van die geest van God. It is the power of the Holy Spirit. When we've got the Holy Spirit living in us, He emboldens us. He helps us to be able to, just like the disciples back then, we are also disciples of Christ. We don't just want to become converts, we want to be disciples. Jesus says, you must be a discipleship maker. Go out and make disciples. Don't make converts. Problem being, many times we go out and say, accept the Lord Jesus Christ, you help them to accept Jesus, and then you just leave them there. Discipling means after you've told someone about Jesus, you take this person and you teach them. This is one of the parts it says in, read it for yourself in Matthew 28, in the Great Commission at the end, where he says, and teach them to keep everything that I have taught you. Many times people don't do that. We don't do it. I used to not do it for many years. I would lead people to Christ. God through me, he used me to lead people to Christ. And then I just leave them. Oh, God will take care of them. But you see what Paul said, for example, about Timothy. And what Peter said, for example, about John Mark. They said they are their children. This is like you are the father and this is your spiritual child. It's like this child is yours. You are responsible for it. You are responsible that this person gets to know Jesus better. That's why it's so important. You see, the whole reason why we are here is not so that I can just give a speech, but so that we all can learn, and what we have learned, we can then teach others. The goal of this is that we one day, all of us here, can teach others the Word of God as well. Point number three. The Heilige Geest is ons trooster. The Holy Spirit is our comforter. You can see that in John 14, 16, to 17. There it says here, He sal ons an ander trooster geer. Ons almal benodig troost in ons lewe. We all will have times where we go through difficult times and we need someone there who can comfort us. Many times we feel like we're alone when we go through difficult times because none of our friends are there. All our friends forsake us. But one will never forsake us. And that is not only the Lord Jesus Christ and not only God the Father, but also the Holy Spirit, whose job, description, one of the things that he does is to comfort us. So if I go through difficult times, practical example, I have problems in my life, no matter what the problems are. I fall back into sin. I do the same things that I did before again. Then I feel bad. I ask God for forgiveness. The Holy Spirit is there and he will comfort you. 
like a father and a mother comforts their child when their child knows they've done something wrong and they ask for forgiveness. He's there to comfort us when we go through difficult times. Can you imagine all of these things that these people went through, the disciples, when they were taken hostage and captive and put in chains and beaten almost dead? And then they sit there and somehow they have the joy of the Lord that is their strength. That is the Holy Spirit within them. The Holy Spirit enables them to have joy, unspeakable peace that is out of this world and joy from God which cannot be understood with human minds. And only the children of God can receive the Holy Spirit. We see this in John 14, 16 to 18. The question is, how do we receive the Holy Spirit? You must be born again. I say this quite often, over and over and over again. If you look, you can see it in John 3, 3. Jesus speaks about it. Jesus so we must be born again. Now, if you want the Holy Spirit, what can you do? You can ask the Father. You're a child of God. If you at home want to ask your Father, you can ask Him. You go to the fridge. You ask Him, can I have something out of the fridge? Of course you can have something out of the fridge. You're my son. What do you have to ask? Go take same thing with God the Father, but he wants to be asked. In this situation, he says, ask the Father. You look at this verse, these verses here. Luke 11, 11 to 13. I'm just going to open up in the English Bible and read it. You can read it in Afrikaans if you want to. Okay. I'm just going to open up in the English Bible. Father, in the Thank you. 